thank you, and Ali. I wish my mom was here to listen to me. <laughs> she left two days ago. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is how I spend most of my time while I don't do photography. <laughs> That's why my work are mostly incomplete. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much once again, all of you, for joining us tonight. Hey, no, not tonight. <laughs> because it's very dark, I think it's already tonight. Uh, I was thinking about what should I present. And, um, you know, uh, in one hour time, and I've tried to make something that makes sense, or no sense at all, obviously. Um, please bear with me. I'll start with something. You know, we all went through COVID period, uh, and all of us had to go through a lot of, I'm sure, quote-unquote, difficult time. You know, some of us went through a more difficult time. Some of us um, struggled in their own ways. Um, I think... Yeah, towards the end of second wave of COVID, I think I was, I was thinking a lot about the idea of a day because, because you know, that's that's what we all have one day. You know, it's 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 the day for everybody. All that we experience, all that we learn, all that we do, all that we think, all that we love or hate or whatever that happens in that one day. And and me, I think at that point in time, I think I was going through a bit of a confusing state of mind. Uh, it was slightly difficult for me and I'm still recovering from it, I guess. And... Um, and I was, yeah, I was feeling a bit um, this idea of not being able to comprehend what what's happening around me. And um, I had written something in my book, in, in my notebook, and that uh, said something like, um, "You." It was in Nepali. I, have, I can loosely translate it in English. I was thinking about the idea of day that comes between two sleeps. And the day, as such, that where I'm not fully awake, awake, I'm half asleep. Maybe you know, I'm I'm seeing things around me, but I'm not being able to comprehend. Um, it's like when we uh, awake from a deep sleep to cough or to drink a glass of water. We are like you know in a semi-wakeful state of mind. And I was thinking my days back then were were like that. I was semi awake. I was, I was seeing things around me, but I was not fully able to comprehend. So, this work I would like to start uh, is is something that I recently experimented. Don't ask me uh, more questions about it, but it's just a starter. <laughs> yeah, I. What I was doing is I wanted to experiment with the idea of this um, still image, still uh, motion motion images, where I, rather than taking photographs, I was using a camcorder uh, borrowed from a very good friend of mine, Viraz. Thank you, Viraz. Uh, and what I was doing is I was walking around the streets of uh, yeah, I was walking around the street, and then I was just pausing for a bit and whatever I saw in front of me uh, that stuck my attention, I s stayed still and recorded it for like one minute or one and a half minute. It was, it was just that, nothing else. It was just a banal thing, you know, that's in front of me. I was, my eyes were seeing it, so I was recording it, holding the camera handheld and breathing in, breathing out. And later on, I created an archive of that. I did that for the period of one month, and um, I created an archive of around 500 still videos. Um, and then later on, I took the screenshot out of it because they were meant to be photographs. I converted those videos into photographs and and uh, particularly chose 100 photographs out of it and made 
a hundred still of a day. Uh, so it's basically a composition, like, you know, uh, 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 a bundle of hundred photographs. I have a, I made a small, you know, a publication, uh, experimented with it. You can take a look later. I, I brought a few photographs just as a representation of that work. Um, it basically makes no sense. It's just a still, a pause, me holding a camera, breathing in, breathing out, and thinking about this idea of being asleep while I'm moving. Yeah, so the day. Um, this quick, that was what I wanted to start with. I'll come to my recent uh, work that I do, in, uh, that I did, that I started in 2015. In 2015, right after I came back from Bangladesh, after still finishing my, you know, um, photography program in school called Patshala, which I was really fortunate to have attended, and that is something that shaped me as a storyteller and and a human being in a larger extent. So I came back and I immediately joined Photo Circle, and we the team was preparing for the first edition of Photo Kathmandu, and I got in got to be part of that too. Um, and then I saw met a lot of photographers. I saw a lot of photo works exhibitions. And and the the photographer, the fresh new photographer, who have like you know you know this just got out of school, let's say, uh, wanted to do something, wanted to use my craft, my medium to talk about something that I cared about. And back then, the um, and that year earthquake happened, and we used photography, we engaged with photography, did something. Um, and right after that, uh, you know, the Nepal promulgated its new constitution. And right after the constitution, uh, a major th um, uprising started to brew in in Tarai region. Um, it was a uh, it was a, a massive protest against the government in the streets of Tarai, mainly in Birgans and major cities of Tarai. Um, there was, I won't go into details, but um, somehow there was a blockade that happened. Um, the protesters, they, 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 they put a delegation in right in the bridge that, uh, that was a main custom gateway between India and Nepal. So that halted all the necessary daily goods that were supposed to enter Nepal. And there was a situation, a crisis situation, all over Nepal, mostly, mainly in Kathmandu. I was in Kathmandu, we were preparing for this major festival, and, you know, it was chaos. We, I know, I only, uh, yeah, everyone struggled. There was, like, huge queues of vehicles uh, in outside of patrol, you know, gas stations. Um, there was crisis for, mostly crisis for fuel, uh, for other, you know, um, food, you know, like other daily goods that was necessary for a city to run. So there was like this, you know, uh, complete mess. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to know, like, I felt like what was going on, you know, I, uh, he was asking to myself what's happening in this country, in this city. And, um, and reading news, it, obviously it has its own limitations. And most of the images that were coming out were, I felt, inadequate. And because also, I would like to believe that there aren't many photographers outside of Kathmandu. So uh, information, the lack of information in newspapers and other media outlets also kind of, uh, yeah, that also affected my understanding of that issue. And um, later on after the festival, I somehow managed to find some. Um, after festival time, and uh, I went there uh, to Birganj to start a project and, and start my inquiry because I was thinking what was going on there was wrong and there were people agitated. There was a new constitution that was promulgated in Nepal, but half of the, 
you know, half of the country was not satisfied with that constitution, whereas uh, other half of the, you know, um, the population was celebrating it. So what is this divide? What is this tension? What is this conflict? I wanted to know. So I went there. I, I went there and I started in a body of work called Eclipse, which I later on give the name. Um, so it, I didn't start with a heavy amount of thinking or research. I just went, you know, because this is this reason was uh, very close to my heart, obviously, because I was born and raised there, despite being um, uh, non-native to that to that land. Maybe my ancestors migrated to that uh, the plains that arise from the hilly region, but I was my my grand my grandfather was born there my father mother all of them were born there and uh, i have shared uh, the same school same playground same you know like even same plate to eat with people who were part of the madhesi community and i and this was uh, this was something that affect, affected me you know in a way so i i, I thought that okay what is this? Oh, what's happening? I think I need to investigate in my own way. So uh, I went there I physically with my camera, roamed around, talked to people from all areas of society, the protesters, politicians, businessmen, school, you know, whoever I met. I uh, wanted to know from all perspectives what was happening in that, in that, in that time and space. Um, but then that kind of informed my uh, informed me subconsciously, I think, and my way of working for this project was very intuitive. Uh, this was my first serious project that I was starting. So I went around um, and I was just responding with my images to the energy that I was feeling the, to the uh, to the thinking that was going on in my head, to the to the conversations that I was listening to, to to the food that I was eating. So, you know, I, I think me being there was was uh, fueling my photographs. Yeah, they and yeah, back then I remember it was it was really uh, intense. The streets were very intense. I was photographing the protest between the police and the protesters. I was photographing uh, the clashes. Um, but then that went on for a few days. Uh, all I had was photograph of people throwing stones and you know, uh, rubber bullets and being hurt, police grabbing someone's neck, you know, all kinds of this action photographs. And, and after that, it, uh, it was not there in the street. There was nothing in the street. So I felt no, this is not, this should not define my idea of this place. This is not something that I want to uh, continue doing. So I, I felt like organically, automatically, I started pushing myself towards towards uh, the inner um, parts of the reason. I left the street and went to the villages and and places that, you know, just wherever my stomach was taking me, you know, I was like rambling all around. Because every I was working in this space, so everything that I was seeing was part of my story. It was part of my energy. It was part of the whatever I was trying to, you know, uh, comprehend. And yeah, very intuitive um, responses to the photographs, and um, and this very fresh um, idea of learning. You know, this uh, they say that. In Nepali, there's this saying that when the 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 new Nayajogile body karani sometimes I felt like that. I was uh, this was very much aesthetically. Uh, I was very much conscious about my aesthetics when I was working. I think um, I was particular about um, you know the kind of photographs the kind of space that I would um, want in my photograph the distance between my subject the colors um, um, and and the subject that I would approach the people in my frame everything I was thinking very much um, yeah while editing obviously and there are tons of other photographs that are completely different I think um, 
Yeah, so this is, and while I was working this project, this was the third Madhis Andolan that was happening, the Madhis uprising. So it's the ethnic community in, in, in Nepal, one of the ethnic communities, whereas Nepal has more than 120 different ethnicities. We speak a lot of different languages, a lot of dialects. Um, so historically, Nepal has always, you know, somehow managed a very monolithic uh, and very, um, what's it, I don't know the word, but very much a unilateral kind of, you know, identity. So uh, protests like this, uprising like this, is um, we're against that narrative, against that, um, yeah, um, history of the country where people were trying to fight for their identity, where people were fighting for their uh, upcoming generations, where people were fighting for their voice. And I was also there finding my own voice. So the work was growing together. I was also growing as a person. And when I was working this project, I, I luckily I met someone who gave a very intense interview interview to me, which um, I remember he said something because he was, uh, was a coordinator of first and second iteration of that Modis uh, uprising, but the third one he left, abandoned it. He was he felt uh, cheated. He felt uh, disregarded for the people who were leading the the third the third uprising and and he said that you know uh, people basically cannot bargain on their sorrow you know there is a lot of sorrow in this space in this land that cannot be bargained in at any cost um, who does the bargaining is the pe people who lead the leaders they when they go to the center they make all these kinds of agreements and uh, they abandon the the cause that they were once fighting for and that's it that he said with a lot of passion and that stayed with me in a way yeah, and and the that kind of um, put a seed in my head that the sense of disenchantment uh, which I later on followed um, like whenever I was talking when I was reading when I was listening when I was watching things I would only this was something that I think was in my stayed in my head, not until when I was working on my, this last project, um, it came out, and I'll talk about it now. So in 2020, I, uh, in 2020, I, this will be very short, quick. Um, in 2020, I started working on a, on a, on a new project, uh, a new body of work, um, you know, in Nepal, we went through a Maoist uprising, Maoist insurgency, many call it civil war, people's war. And um, I was, like I said, I was born and raised in, in Tarai, and the name of my village is Chapa Bazar. And um, and I was six when the war officially started. I was 16 when the war ended. Most of my growing up, the childhood, formative years of my life, I've seen the... Uh, the, the um, the yeah, seen that up, uh, insurgency, the Maoist insurgency from uh, from a very uh, from a close distance. I think you know, I've I've seen, I feel the dread of that night. I feel the and uh, the silence of those um, other days, uh, and uh, yeah, that fear. I still remember. Um, that uncertainty, that um, the the sound of the bombs that were um, that um, exploded in the uh, in all the government offices and buildings, I still remember. I still remember the barking of the dogs in this emptiness of the night. Um, yeah. Anyways, um, one morning, um, luckily, um, none of my family members were affected, like no uh, case, physical casualties that happened. But uh, my one of my closest friends, a friend who uh, we went school with, lost uh, his mother. 
his mother was assassinated by the government forces while he while she was sleeping at her home the the, the unified unified government forces security forces um, um, barged in their home and killed her um, yeah cold blooded and and i remember that how how much it affected my friend and uh, his family and and i remember how he would oppose uh, anyone who he would see in a civil in a uniform a police uniform or a army uniform i remember time and again he would be the, in the forefront whenever there was something that that had to be done to the police you know he would be shouting he would fight he would the rage i, I remember he's not in nepal anymore he's um, uh, he lives in uh, in japan i remember and every time in facebook we are connected we talk once in a while in facebook he, sh- he used to share a poem every every in most of the times in his mother's birthday in international mothers day in mothers day every time when in there was women's day he would share it international you know like um, political days that rem- that rem- that is supposed to commemorate or remember the war so you would share this poem that poem was in nepali i've just done i've given a little ex- excerpt of that poem in english translated by again another good friend of mine yutsa um it it basically the poem is filled with longing where he basically is asking for his mother to visit him in his dreams every night um where he is basically in nepali culture in hindu culture the people who have dead uh, when you see them in our dreams it's not considered good but he is kind of saying that you know if i don't see you in my dreams who else you know how is that a bad omen it's a very hard um, every time i used to read this poem in my wall facebook wall my heart sank i thought it was written, written by him but he kind of owned it you know in the way he used to share it but it was written by an, a poet uh, named saroja sigdel it was published in seto party um with her permission i'm using it here and yeah and the poem and i wanted to do something about the war and um, and and that was when the the lockdown was at peak i was not i had all kind kinds of plan that all kinds of things that i wanted to do with this uh, story and uh, and travels and everything but due to pandemic i was forced to be in my room and i was not being able to go out and shoot in kashmir i would go out to shoot the police would catch me because i don't have a press card and i was not legally uh, allowed to take photographs despite i had a formal training in photography and etc etc um they would put me in holding centers and and there were two key things that happened in this process by um one is i was in the in this master class that kind of forced me to you know uh, keep going and 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 not give up uh, and and one of my mentor i remember she she told me that you know you're doing something a story about resistance you're doing a story about revolution i think you have to have that you know uh, um, you're working on stories about guerrillas um you have to find your own guerrilla technique to make this work you know you have to you have to go ahead uh, in ways that uh, you would not otherwise in if you are allowed to go out and shoot and that kind of pushed me and i remember the other thing that i was thinking about in that time while we i work in a public library it's a it's a public archive and we we used to talk a lot about archives and uh, normally there are two kinds of archive one is the public and the other is the private and um, in, in one of my conversation with uh, uh, with in a workshop again you know because i do a lot of i'm part of a lot of workshop i also learn you know <laughs> and i use it um i remember we were having a conversation about how this new kind of archive that's brewing up which is the internet and uh, and how the uh art historians and curators might find a hard time in 10 or 15 years from now to figure out this new archive how it 
affects the, the overall art and photography scene and the history. So I, okay, okay, that, that is the, um, something that I could, this is a, a, an area that I can dive into and because I was forced to sit inside the room, I was using internet all the time, I was browsing internet all the time, I was, um, I started doing, I was researching at the same time using the internet, I was currently finding newspaper cutouts and everything, um, I was photographing also, I was, um, I was taking photos of statues back then, just photographing this very ugly, uh, <laughs> torn out uh, statues. And this photograph on the left, the, the photograph of this um, this man uh, who is the king of, who used to be the king who unified the country. Uh, I always find this photograph very uh, interesting, um, which I don't want to share. But yeah, that kind of as <laughs> and this i think this was a, a trigger another trigger i want i started from that finger you know that one finger this idea of unity this idea of unity and diversity i started questioning that what does that really mean you know what does that mean does that signify strength power does it signify diversity does does it signify unity does it signify peace what does it signify what is it trying to show in nepal's political context what does it mean um yeah and anyways i started photographing that statues but then again i was not allowed to go out every time you know uh, and it was getting a little bit too tiring um these are just reference photographs so i'll i'll come to the I'll come to the um, uh, main point. So the war that, um, like my friend whose name is Samir, he lost his mother, like him. There were many, many families who might, might have lost uh, many of their relatives, closed ones, loved ones. There are 17,000 casualties, 17,000 people were killed from all sides. Uh, many people uh, were disappeared, whose whereabouts are still unknown. Um, and when I was researching, when I was thinking, when I was planning this work, there was a, there were stories coming from all direction. Like there was like uh, all kinds of stories, all kinds of incidents, all kinds of uh, deadly uh, violence uh, incidents that um, I was I was being exposed to uh, in. I was I was informed about that, and I felt like I need time to do this story, you know. But in that uh, period of time, I was not allowed to. I was not being able to. So I I found an easy way to do this story, basically. Um, so I was thinking, and you know, okay, if I had to, uh, when I was uh, when I was, am I using when I was when I was a lot of time? Okay. Um, Yeah, so, and then I arrived in this idea of um, disenchantment, which I talked about briefly in my past work. So disenchantment was a word that came. Okay, I will now, I'll try to, uh, I'll try to, you know, uh, bind all that I wanted to say in one word. Uh, the word would be disenchantment. And in Nepali, it was mohavanga. And mohavanga would mean something that you love, but then you don't really love, and it kind of uh, crashed. Uh, something that you used to love, which you don't anymore. Uh, yeah. Um, and I wanted to find out where does that manifest? How, how, in how can I uh, show the idea of disenchantment? And I started collecting photographs of agreements. Um, people, these powerful people, mostly men, coming to one place and agreeing to uh, something, you know, agreeing, making agreements on behalf of the people. And again, remembering the, the quote that someone told me in Bilganj in 2015, where he says that the sorrow of the people can only be bargained by the leaders. It can never be bargained to any inch by the people, you know, and I started collecting photographs of handshakes from the internet. I am I'm so sorry that basically I stole photographs from the internet. And what I did was I cropped 
uh, just the hands and expanded it 800% in my Photoshop. And I went to this pixel. You know, when you expand the digital photograph, you reach these pixels. And, and to me, I think at that point in time, for me, I, all these incidents, all these stories, all these issues that I was uh, being informed with, at the crux of that matter was always, you know, this um, this hollow promises that people that the leaders had made, all these hollow agreements, uh, the promises that were that were made but never never fulfilled. Um, so these are basically uh, crops, manipulated images, cropped, expanded, eight hundred percent, and. Uh, Yeah. Uh, and I made a film at the end. I'll I'll show that film and then I'll end it. Okay. So this is a three-minute film. We'll see this and we'll open for questions. Only body from Jota Gorero, Jonataka, you discuss with Pudit, Adibasi, Jonadati, Dalit, Moila, Muslim, Madesi, Bikat, Chetraka, Jonataka, Mudami, Mankotai. this 30,000 people, although we are very uh, sorry for that, but we feel that in comparison in, in, with the history uh, uh, to fight against the feudalism, it is not a high price. Sorry for that. I made this work in the time when the government, the, the uh, government uh, for were saying that uh, not to go out, and the internet was saying not to use your hand and don't shake hands. So basically, I made the work about the politicians making shaking hands. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's my time.
No, no, you uh, you warned me already. So I did. Right. No, because I, I don't remember where I saw the video first, but it really stayed with me, just the handshake images. And now that I'm actually seeing it on a large screen with proper sound for the first time, um, I find the sound really compelling. And I know you hadn't worked with sound before this from what you just shared. So could you talk a little bit about how you found the kind of sound, the rhythm and the pacing? Because what I, I love about the video is also that, you know, a lot of the video work that um, I see, it's, it's and even in the festival this time, I find it really relatable. Like a lot of the time when I've seen video art in galleries, I find that even if it's really compelling, I can't imagine a larger public audience easily engaging with it. And when I saw this work, I was like, you can watch this on YouTube and feel what it has to say. You could watch this in a gallery. There's so many um, spaces in which it can communicate what it's saying, whether or not you know or care about the Nepali context of it even, right? Even just that repeated image of the handshake comes across. But I think the sound really plays a really important role in that. So if you could share your process of coming to that rhythm and the sound. Yeah. Um, so this was the 16th draft uh, I made for the this the three minute video. And I might have used a lot of sound that I was royalty free. Um, and yeah, there were in the beginning. I remember showing the first and second draft to my friends, and then how they commented, being very sensationalized because of this beat. And yeah, of, of course, they were making comments about the sound, how it was not going with the images. And yes, of course, a lot of you know um, trial and error that happened on choosing the sound, obviously. And later on, I came across this, you know, uh, this. Uh, tabla or whatever it was hands that was used and um, and it kind of made sense to me uh, but I didn't I didn't put a lot of thought you know it just clicked it's a sense of rightness I felt you know this okay this goes with my work um, and I used it and and later on uh, after that we again this also um, uh, signifies this idea of tandav which later on, uh, came out, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it it kind of happens semi accidentally, you know. Yeah, thank you very much. Thoughts, questions? <laughs> it's quite clear. <laughs> <don't worry>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, Alana has the question. Yes. Um, I was just wondering how this work has been shown in Nepal. Um, what kind of, like, online, in a gallery, like, in public spaces or anything like that, and what sort of, how it's received locally? Mm, it has not been shown yet. Uh, it has not. Uh, I've shown it privately to friends and, you know, family and and try to get a sense of what they feel. Uh, but besides that, it has not been published or shown anywhere in Nepal. Uh, I recently I was part of a group exhibition in uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh, curated by uh, Mane Masif. Uh, so it was part of that show. And I was not there to see it personally, but uh, it was, yeah, the video was shown with the, with the film. But yeah, we, I have plans of, you know, doing showing it here. Do you feel like sharing um, the nature of those plants? Um, you, you don't have to if it's still like... But I'm just, I'm really curious and excited by how things kind of move um, in different spaces, how the works we make. And yeah, and I can see in this work a little bit like what Alicia said is that it, um, you know, its value is that it, it's emerged for you from a very, uh, not only personal, but a specific political context. But so much of the work resonates across a lot of different um, mm. political spheres as yep. well. Like, we can relate to it. Yep. So, yeah, I'm really interested in how it might um, be received within Nepal now um, or, or elsewhere too. In, um, one thing that uh, we started 
with relating to this work, um, Rwanda is sitting right in behind you. We are basically uh, thinking about working on a publication together uh, where we are trying to idea of, you know, compiling some political work, visual politics, and uh, make up a small publication and send it to the Prime Minister's office. <laughs> that was the only plan that I can think of. But yeah, I do. This isn't, like I said, it's an incomplete work because of, uh, I don't know why, uh, but hopefully I'll get, I'll take this work forward and, you know, give it a better body and muscles and hair and <laughs> nails so that it can. <laughs> Just some context for everybody, I guess. Um, one of the voices that, I mean, for those of you who are local will know, of course, but one of the voices that speaks and says, you know, the sorry for that part um, is the current prime minister of Nepal. Um, he was the chair, he is the chairman of the Maoist party, um, was one of the sort of... Supreme commander of... Supreme uh, commander of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, and uh, and was at the head of the war. Um, and so when Sagar was making this work, he was not the prime minister. Uh, currently, he is. Um, and so these, yes, yeah, Sagar, where are you going to show this work? <laughs> <laughs> I will, yeah. That would make more sense. I'm very bold, you know. I can go on for it. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's an interesting time because, you know, on the one hand, you know, the, the funding has moved on, transitional uh, justice programs have ended here, um, but of course, um, this 30, this 10-year period leaves very deep legacies, uh, socially, politically, culturally, uh, in lives directly and indirectly, um, and so, yeah, these stories... Um, are still, uh, unfortunately, still very current, um, and yeah. so... Yeah. yeah, there's so much um, that has happened in the past 20, 25 years. Uh, if we just look at this political, you know, history of Nepal, uh, it's overwhelming, you know. You, I just got, I think at that point I got overwhelmed where to start and how to take this ahead. Um, yeah, there's a lot there, like the next film, screening that's going to happen will also will kind of inform you about that, you know. The idea, the title, it kind of stayed with me, this idea of long tales and short stories. It really makes sense. Yeah, they must start. That would make it difficult. <laughs> so Try I'll work with please this. Do. Please <laughs> okay, maybe I will, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I work with you, so I, I'm quite familiar with your work, and we've had a chance to talk about it as well. Um, I think one thing I haven't asked you before, and I wanted to kind of press you to maybe respond to that, is when I look at your work, uh, your body of work here that you've shown also, um, to me, it registers as not necessarily a, a critique of a particular like um, political ideology or a party or... Um, a, a, a particular political vision. It's to me, it seems like a, in a way a critique of the political field at large itself. You know that uh, a political field in and of itself. Um, so I wanted to kind of ask you, like, um, what would you want to replace that with? You know, what is your vision for politics? How would how do you want politics to be practiced differently? Um, or are you do you propose this as perhaps a manifesto for anarchy? Um, I. I wanted to hear you, you know, sort of uh, maybe also guide us towards that. You know, what is the alternative that you, perhaps I, I, I believe you have been thinking about it because I think it, uh, it captivates you quite to quite a large extent. Yeah. yeah. This morning, um, this morning I actually started with this idea of thinking about this idea of promise and the promise that I kept to my sister of cooking her food during our exam period. So I, today I was, uh, I consciously, rather than working on my project, I went and uh, make a good meal for her so that she could go and give her exams. So, because she was, she was telling me that if you can't keep the promise, don't make it. <laughs> so I, I kept my promise. 
and uh, I subsided the more, you know, priority things and then I did that. And I was thinking about, and I've been thinking about this idea of what do I want to do with this work? You know, what am I trying to question? And I'm also reflecting in my own life, you know, the kind of promises that I keep and I don't keep it actually. And and the idea of day also comes there, you know, the, the idea of day that we all have the same day and, you know, and I don't know, I sometimes I feel like giving the benefit of the doubt to the people who I am trying to fight or question against, but but yeah, I, I feel like the change will start from me, I think, you know, very idealistic. Really. But this idea of keep not keeping not being able to keep promise, taking time, you know, being slow in things. I am like I think I've started from myself. I'm questioning myself like if I if I had to make a change, be the change, where where would I start? Or um, I have not reached there to you know like give a political vision to anybody else. But um, but if I had to give a, a give a if I had to think about the vision or um, the way in which politics should be practiced, I would say mm, yeah. Uh, be more accountable, and uh, I don't know if that's uh, that's uh, that answers your question. But every time you know you're the first time you ask questions, that always, <laughs> always. Uh, of course, the of course the question about anarchy is from the worst. <laughs> that is my aspiration. <laughs> Um, I don't have a question as much as just to say thank you very much. Um, the, the images speak, uh, I think they really give an insight into the kind of person that you are, and I think that's a, quite a compliment. Um, but most of all, I'm here just to give you a high five to say well done on using your lockdown constructively. Um, I wish I had, and I'm pretty sure there are many other people here that can say the same thing. <laughs> thank you very much, Sam. Okay, we're done? Yeah. yeah. Can you just, yeah. One more. Hello. Um, Sagar, you mentioned Samir, uh, your friend, mm -hmm. who I think, I guess, uh, partly that's sort of where you started thinking yeah. about this work. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you've shown this to him. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I guess, just curious to know how he might have responded to a work like this which feels so visceral to people, like to us who are not even directly involved, right? Yeah. And I don't know, maybe if that's too personal, I, you don't yeah. have to answer. No, 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 I mean... What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, I've shown this work, I've talked with him, he lives in Japan, uh, I've not been able to yeah, have a face-to-face, -face, you know, like physical meeting with him, but he's very, uh, you know, like easygoing, he... Um, He's a very poetic kind of person, you know, he loves poetry and and he didn't really comment that much on the film. He was, he, he reserved his, uh, his comments, I think, you know, he mostly talked about the poem and, you know, like what it meant and, you know, and he kept on switching to other topics. That's what I remember. He kept on switching to other poems and other poets of Nepal and... Uh, he, he, he uh, yeah. I think I should go back and you know actually have a proper conversation with him. But I don't think he made a very uh, yeah. His silence and his switching one topic to the other was was his response. I think he didn't wanted to engage. That's the idea of more longer. I think yeah. I say it. <coughs> okay. I mean, I should just say that obviously Sagar has, um, he shared only a very small excerpt of the first project that he was sharing. So if people do want to visit, it's, some of it's on his website. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Sagar. Yeah. And good luck showing this in Kathmandu somewhere <laughs> soon. <laughs>